Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Kenny, a Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is Missing 411. And this is a missing persons segment. And before we get really into things, and there's some good things to talk about today, I was just sent this by somebody who is a uh, distributor of our movies. And what happened was, is that we were just notified this morning that Amazon is going to put our movie up on a banner with some of these huge movies. The Book Club, Avatar, Otto, The Whale. This is unbelievable, folks. You only get this it, unless the movie has been getting good ratings and has been performing online. And to put the movie up with those movies, it's a real honor. You can't buy those. Amazon has to do that on their own. So when we heard that, it's only happened a few other movies with this distributor and they were, uh, they were pretty surprised. So I'll say this again, Missing 411, the UFO connection. It really will give you some insight you never had before into our work. And I get a lot of people saying, well, you're not making any progress. You know, what are you doing? You haven't watched the movie yet. And I take a lot of heat for, well, what are you doing? And well, you're not getting anywhere. Watch the movie and tell me about it. So just uh, within the last week up in Glacier National Park, uh, a young man disappeared. And in our local newspaper, it's called the Hungry Horse News. Hungry Horse is the name of the dam up there where I film every once in a while. There's a little town at the bottom. It says, after four days in the woods, missing hiker found alive in Glacier. Here's what the article says. And I want, I'm, I'm gonna read this to you for a distinct reason. It says, after spending nearly four days in the woods of Glacier National Park backcountry, 19 year old man found cold, but alive. At approximately 11 p.m. on May 8th, two Bear Air Rescue Helicopter located a 19-year-old Matthew Reed who was initially reported missing on Sunday, May 7th. He was said to went off hiking the Huckleberry Mountain Trail on Friday, May 5th. Let me stop here for a sec. Obviously, this man didn't know what the Huckleberry Mountain Trail is. Ay, ay, ay. There are more grizzly bears, more black bears on Huckleberry, Huckleberry Mountain Trail than just about any place else in the park. You have to be a complete fool to hike up there alone. He was a fool. Because more people get attacked by a bear when they're alone than if you have two, three, or four. It starts off, let's say you have five people in a hiking party. Chances of you getting attacked by a bear, very small. But the number goes up as the number of people in your group go down. Most commonly, people are attacked by a bear when there's just them. This man, young man, is very lucky. On Monday, two bear air picked up a thermal. Remember I always talk to you about FLIR being used on a helicopter? Pay attention. On Monday, two bear air picked up a thermal heat signature in heavily forested terrain. Rescue personnel lowered a rescuer down to Reed's location and found him somewhat responsive. Reed was extricated via a 175-foot hoist, flown out of the park, and transferred to Evergreen Ambulance. That area of Huckleberry Mountain, located off the Camas Road in Glacier's North Fork region, heavily forested, thick with brush, and very steep. He is in stable condition, the park said, no release. Reports indicate Reed hiked the Huckleberry Lookout Trail on Friday and reached the first saddle where he encountered a snowfield covering the trail. He slipped into an unnamed drainage on the east side of Huckleberry Mountain. He descended into chest deep snow, losing his phone, water, bottle and shoes and shoes. Upon determining that he could not make it back up the trail, he started working his way down the drainage. Reed was last heard from on Friday afternoon. 
His vehicle was located Sunday at the Huckleberry Lookout Trailhead after he was reportedly overdue to Rangers. Rangers conducted a hasty search Sunday afternoon and expanded the search Monday. Glacier National Park would like to thank Two Bear Air, U.S. Border Patrol, Flathead County Sheriff, North Valley, and Flathead Search and Rescue. Huckleberry Lookout Trail reopened Tuesday morning. All told, no more than 30 people helped in the search. So, man is very, very, very lucky to be alive. He can thank Two Bear Air for his survival. Two Bear Air, what is it? There's a billionaire that lives in Whitefish. And he owns a capital firm, capital finance firm in the Bay Area. He lives up here, though. And he wanted to do something good. He's also an advanced first aider. I think he's also a paramedic. But he formed a rescue organization here. And it's at Glacier International Airport. And it has a chief pilot, a secondary pilot, paramedics. And they fly here, Wyoming, Idaho, all over to rescue people. Since I've been here, I, can't, I don't know how many people they've rescued. Tons. It's all free. It's all free because this billionaire decided to do something. It is a huge service. Huge. I can guarantee to you that this man would be dead by now if Two Bear hadn't found him. They said he was barely conscious when they did find him. And if it wasn't the FLIR device on a helicopter, they wouldn't have found him. Now what that looks like, I know, because I've flown on the police helicopter multiple times as an observer. And what you do is you have a screen. It's almost like you're watching TV, except it looks different. And heat signatures just pop out at you. And when you're flying along and you're looking at the woods, you're not going to see a heat signature unless you see a deer or a bear or something. But a human's going to be pretty, pretty darn big. And when you see that, you know something's up. And when you've been watching it long enough, you know what to look for. Two Bear did a great job on that. Man owes them a, a great sense of gratitude for his survival. Matthew Reed. I don't know where he's from, but hiking up there alone was not smart. Hiking alone, period, without a personal locator beacon, not smart. Now, did you see in that story where he was on the trail one second and then boom, he's off the trail the next? And he maybe never planned on going off trail, but he did. So he loses his shoes and he starts to freeze. My question is, do you think a personal locator beacon would have saved him for sure? Yes. How many times do I have to tell you about a personal locator beacon? I'm gonna keep telling you until everybody I know gets one. Okay, let's start with the letters. And there's some good ones here. Dear Mr. Pilatus, I'm a 51 year old female that has struggled with mental illness my whole life. Most of my doctors say I have generalized anxiety disorder. I was watching Ben's YouTube channel and I recognized some things I did in my 20s and early 30s. I looked to spiritual literature, all kinds, and studied night and day to try to get an understanding and a reason why my life felt so difficult. I went off to college at 16 and a year and I had a breakdown there and had to come home to disappointed parents. It seemed I could learn anything but Something would send me in a tailspin and I would always sabotage myself. After religion gave me some solace, it always returned. Self-hate, guilt, uncertainty. I've tried to commit suicide many times. I was just never successful. No one has ever known this. I tried to hang myself four years ago and failed. I've tried to OD many times, but I always wake up. I also have a body that is breaking down on me so fast that I don't think I will see my 55th birthday. I relate to Ben, trying to understand why I can't be like everybody else. I've done the opposite of what Ben did, but it is all because the way we feel naturally is so uncomfortable, we try to change it. 
I just wanted you to remember that he didn't want you to hurt. He didn't want to hurt you, but the body to some of us is a prison. Mental pain is awful and hard to explain. I chose not to have children and I can't work due to physical disabilities. So this makes living extremely hard, feeling like a burden. I'm so sorry for your loss and I know the overwhelming feelings Ben has. Feelings, Ben was feeling. God bless your heart and family. I'm sure Ben was hurting so bad he couldn't step outside the pain to realize that he would cause you pain. In his mind, he probably thought he was doing you a favor. Please forgive him. He is always with you. So understand, my feelings for Ben are 10 times more guilt than anger. I think about what this lady says about how bad that pain must have been. I understand. I get it. I know. But what people don't know, and if Ben's in here watching right now, I would tell him, son, what you did to my life and the lives of everyone that loves you is give me barely survivable grief. If you're somebody out there that is struggling just like this lady, I want you to understand. Just like we may not understand you, I doubt you understand us because you're too busy trying to live, trying to fight off the demons, trying to understand why you're here. But your parents, your loved ones are, are trying to find a way to help. And I know it's very hard to see that. I get it. But by you taking your life in many ways, you leave behind your loved ones in a life of their own little hell. Because by taking your life, it makes us think we were part of that problem and we couldn't find a solution. And you are a part of our lives forever. I can't run away from Ben's death. So many people have taken their lives in the last two years. You need to take responsibility for your actions and understand that you were placed on this earth to be a part of our lives, just like we're part of your life. And being a part of our lives means that you have to live up to a standard, just like we have to live up to a standard with you. And while sometimes that may be really tough, it's kind of part of the deal of being here on earth. Right now, things are pretty messed up, no doubt. But there's never been a day when Ben was here that I wouldn't give him a hug, sat down with him and looked him eye to eye and said, son, we'll get through it together. There was a time I had to live with him for a while. I went and lived with him. I didn't care. I didn't care. There's a lot of people in this world that I've met that have lost a loved one. They're just like me. I know, I see it, I hear it. But I'm not angry with Ben, not even 1%. Sometimes when I go somewhere, 
and I see something that's just astronomically beautiful. I think about him. I think, oh my gosh, son, if you were here, you could see that. You've never seen that. I feel almost guilty that I have the ability to see it. But I know that growing up and taking college classes, I took a philosophy class one time at Berkeley. And the question was, are we living in hell right now? It was an interesting question and it caused some heated debates in the class. It wasn't a, wasn't a big class, but I remember that. We, didn't, we had people from all walks of life, all religions. And looking back on it now, I, was that part of an agenda? I don't know. But first six, eight months after Ben died, kind of felt like I was in hell. Sometimes today feels that way. But nowadays, I'm having a few more bad days or a few more good days than bad days, which is, which is a blessing. But I have deep compassion for everyone out there that has mental illness. If you're a parent and you even have 1% thought that your child, your son, your daughter might be thinking about taking their life, call them up, go meet them, sit down, have the conversation. Look them right in the eye. Say, I'm worried about you. And ask the tough question. Hey Dave, in response to your question about burning white sage, the answer is yes, I feel significantly lighter in my thoughts and my home emits positive energy, white sage. I'm a 31 year old female Australian and work as an oncology hematology nurse. So I'm constantly surrounded by suffering, pain and heartbreak. It is my curse and the biggest asset to be an empath, but I could not function without regular practicing of house cleansing. Thank you for dedicating your life's work to discovering the truth and creating a village of loyal, positive and supported people. You are a leader and we are your disciples. And I think you're leading me, you guys. I'm not leading anybody. next article was just so timely and such a perfect place to put this. The title of it was, In Canada, Doctors Can Now Prescribe National Park Visits. Usually you would not expect to come out of the doctor's office with a list of medicines to purchase. That would be your expectation. The recommendation to rest, sleep more, or eat healthier. But now as part of a pilot program, doctors in Canada can now prescribe a walk in the park or rather an annual pass to the country's stunning national parks. That'd be weird. There's almost no medical condition that nature doesn't make better, said Dr. Melissa Lem, general physician and director of the PARX initiative. Rich organized the distribution of an initial batch of 100 annual passes. The goal of the PARX initiative is to give medical professionals more ways to encourage patients to spend more time in nature 
Lem, Lem recommends at least two hours in nature a week and at least 20 minutes at a time. The health benefits of spending time in nature are well documented. It lends to higher self-esteem in children, lower stress hormones and heart rate variability, and amplifies the benefits of exercise. It can help your memory and improve your focus. It alleviates the pains of aging and strengthens your immune system. While Canada's initiative is a great idea, it also comes as a reminder that national parks should be free to begin with. That way everyone can have access to them. Managing them might cost tax money, but the preventive medical benefits will offset that cost and everyone will be happier. Amen. I've always, I've always thought that. So who bought the national parks? We did. Who maintains the national parks? We do. Then why do we have to pay to go into a national park? Ka-ching. Next letter. Hey Dave, I was born in Salford, Greater Manchester in the UK. I've followed your work very closely for the few years now. I'm just dropping here to li a line to say that over the past few months there has been a lot of missing people in the greater area of Manchester, UK, to the point where they have got a billboard with missing people on them on a hotline. I have never ever known this in all my life. One man went missing just after Christmas in Salford. They have searched that canal for days. He worked at a Salford Royal Hospital, and I have a friend who was a nurse there and knew him. I was informed that after the canal had been searched by the police, they found nothing. But then two weeks into January, they found some clothing on the embankment. As far as I am aware, the papers have not quoted that according to my friend, and the papers quoted his wallet and mobile phone and a small whiskey bottle. Still no sign of him. He has no, medica, no record of mental health issues and is devoted to his partner who also works at the Sulford Regional, correct that, Sulford Royal Hospital. And he is a devoted father to his children. Disappeared, still missing. Honestly, Dave, I have another case that is very mysterious. It happened at Alice Holt Forest. <laughs> Through you and your work, it has got me questioning these disappearances. I just thought I could mention it to you and I would have mentioned before about the being found in shallow water in the canals in Manchester. Manchester, UK, know very well. They had, the police kind of coined what was happening there called the pusher. There was a belief that somebody was pushing the people into the canals. Problem with all this. First of all, it was a stupid idea. Is that almost all the people could swim, number one. Number two, a lot of the canals where the people were found were shallow and they could have just stood up and they didn't. A lot of people in Manchester died. Nobody has ever seen one go in the water. Nobody's ever seen anybody pushed. Just like all the missing 411 cases. Matches everyone in missing 411 a sobering coincidence. I've talked about it incessantly. There's something there, trust me folks. 16 countries this is going on in, including the UK, USA, Canada. The man goes on and says, I question why the police in each case say no suspicious circumstances. So where has the man been in the last few weeks? And if they advertise in the papers, and I know they'd be looking for him. It did not make sense. You can't hide with that amount of cameras that operate through our cities at night. Keep up the good work, Dave. Yeah, nothing's ever on camera. So how's this happening? Yeah. Hey Dave, thanks for showing us the, your dog, Huck. She's absolutely beautiful. I was so glad you picked her up and let's see her. Thanks. I wish I could give her a hug too. I love dogs and really admire their abilities to perceive things we can't even come close to. Exhibit, exhibiting the same emotions we do. I know she'll easily and quickly become a loving part of the family. Uh, Huck's a huge part of our family. Once again, listening to your case stories, it never fails to dawn on me how absolutely horrifying and dreadfully shocking these disappearances and unexplained deaths are. The fact that many victims were highly experienced outdoors people only adds to the puzzle. That these are real people suffering real tragedy and mystifying circumstances, the fate's almost surreal. 
If we put ourselves in either their or their family situation, the effects are immensely devastating. To me, there can be no other dilemma greater than to only be able to wonder, where did they go and where are they? That's a terrifying nightmare. What could be more haunting? Why isn't the government doing more about it instead of simply declining to talk about it because they don't have any answers? This is a gross failure on their part. I really do hope, like you say, you are getting closer to understanding what's really going on. In my observation, success often comes to the ones who never quit and keep digging and working beyond the efforts of those who have come before. Someone has to keep prodding despite the hurdles. How many times do we learn of cold cases which are eventually solved because someone had the fortitude to tirelessly forge on in the face of near impossibility and finally come to uncover the truth? I have nothing but utter admiration for you for them. You're one of those people, if you stick to it and never give up, I believe more often than not, certainties and truths are eventually revealed. It is a hard and arduous road, but this is the key to success. Well, I agree. Watch Missing 411, The UFO Connection. I believe your intense investigations into these cases will pay off. Having been a police officer, I know you have the angst to clearly see when things don't add up and you know when to deny the sometimes feeble explanations others might offer simply to bring closure to the mystery due to the lack of reasonable answers. I hear you loud and clear and often find myself agreeing with that some theories put forth by others are highly unlikely. It's clear that even the subtle nuances are not slipping past you. The hunches you perceive are right on. Please don't ever quit. For many victims and their families, no doubt you represent the only hope they have. Your efforts are greatly appreciated and respected. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. I appreciate those kind and supportive words. And supportive words mean a lot to everybody who's on a road and gets a lot of hate mail. Oh, I get hate mail all the time. Okay, next one. Hey, Dave. This may be immature, Im premature, but I'm halfway through your books. Gary Wayne, author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind. Also in my spare time, I suffer from insomnia. I've fallen down the rabbit hole conspiracy theories. First of all, conspiracy theories was a trademarked, it wasn't trademarked, but it was came up with by the CIA to demean people, to make them seem not credible. That was decades and decades ago, and it still carried on. Truth is, most conspiracy theories turn out to be true. With everything happening in the world, including the proven mistrust of media, the government of many countries, the Vatican, and I'm Catholic, among them, I won't name, makes me wonder how much it is a conspiracy and how much is just theory. I know you have a very intellectual team, including yourself, that has been working on the missing project. I do believe there are several species of intelligence we will say aliens, although I'm not sure they are technically aliens, that can use portals and other frequency weapons to take humans or harm humans for whatever their species-specific species needs. I know you've said in the past you cannot add blood type into the equation. That's true. You can't. It's never listed in a report. It's HIPAA protected. It's against the law to get it. I realize you have to do up to more. You've done up to two thousand cases. That'd be quite the task. I'm just wondering if the excerpt from the Bible about animals and humans going into clouds, returning in mixed species before the flood, references either aliens or the fallen angel. Could that explain the different species or the Greek Egyptian gods? Could they be Nephilim? And we are now dealing with their offspring. I find a lot of truth in folklore and mythology. A lot of the keys to unlock present-day mysteries. I also really wonder if the entertainment business is just hiding the truth in plain sight. Possibly a universal law that intentions must be first told before they can be done. Well, is the entertainment business hiding the truth? Yeah. First year of the X-Files came out of an FBI agent's work. Uh, if you go back and you watch The Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger and the creature that had the predator effect and go watch Missing 411, The Hunted. Also, there's talk of 13 bloodlines and 10 kings that protect the secret societies who watch over portals and work with human elites. 
with the end result of enslaving mankind. There's more information I could include, but I know these emails get long. It was just a thought. What if some missing that are never found are taken because they are part of these bloodlines and are taken for whatever purpose? We don't know. Some may be taken for not being in those bloodlines, but will be pivotal in the spiritual and earthly war. I know most people don't like to consider the thought of others walking among us. However, many times we have all walked past someone, met someone, talked to them and got this gut feeling that there's something off about them. Just an example, when I was a communication officer in law enforcement, we were attached to the jail. I had to go back there a few times, fully aware if there was a hostage situation, the doors would close and it would be not open for me. I ran into a man who murdered his wife and son who was being transported to court. Face to face, I looked into his eyes. Just my opinion, he had no soul. And I could say he may not even be human. I'm sure we've all felt that same way in our lives. Just a con consideration, maybe a puzzle piece. Keep up the factual news segments. Most people don't want to hear the truth anywhere else. I appreciate you, Dave. Well, thank you. The factual news, missing from one, the factual news, the fastest growing segment of our website, bar none. Okay, news, Australia. Three men share details of a Yowie sighting in rural Queensland. I don't usually talk about this, but this one was good. And I won't say what or how, but the wording in it is compelling to me that it was truthful. Three men in Australia, Queensland, have claimed they came across a Yowie while driving home from work. They reported that three plantation workers were driving on Saturday, December 4th to the Jimna base camp, where they allegedly spotted a slouched over figure under a streetlight. The men said the figure noticed them, turned in their direction. We initially thought it was a boar or a really big animal until we got closer and saw it run off in a very ape-like way. Seamus Fitzgerald said via the Brisbane publication, describing the mysterious figure as having very long arms. I've never really had a paranormal or strange experience like that before. Hardly slept that night, and the feeling was overwhelming that I'd see, seen something that I never really believed in previously. Workmate Sterling Bennett said the group was immediately confused when it crossed paths with the unknown entity. We were in utter disbelief of what we were seeing, he said. It definitely was a scary moment. As I said, I was so confused and shook of what we were saying that it got closer and closer, it didn't make sense. Locals from the tiny town of Jimna, J-I-M-N-A, has a population of 91 have reportedly claimed to have seen evidence of the supported Yowie in the bush before. We went on a few hikes after to see it, but sadly weren't organized too well, too many people and too loud. However, after speaking to locals, it seems the Yowies are pushed, pushed out in storms. Mr. Fitzgerald said he never previously believed in the existence of Yowies, but said the experience Prompt them to go looking for another sighting. I'm very intrigued to find out what other people have said. So I'm going to give you a little. When I was in Australia, giving a book, doing our book tour back there, a very good friend said, Dave, how would you like to meet probably the most famous Yowie researcher in Australia? I said, oh, yeah. So they took me to this man's house, older man, very nice. And he showed me all the different casts he had and he was so proud to show me these things. 100%, he was on, on the money. He also found, I guess it would be handprints, foot, knee. The man was fastidious. And you could just tell by his demeanor, it wasn't lying. But uh, it was one of the highlights of this trip to Australia to meet him. Next one. Hey, Dave, I just watched your recent video. And the email you read from the person who lost all these people in their lives really hit home. Had a relationship recently and back in, like, in October, right after we discussed having kids and her moving in. But then it got yanked away. 
And she wanted to give her abusive ex a second chance. Talk about a gut punch. Then in 2021, I lost my grandma in February. Then my mom and her daughter passed away in June out of nowhere. I'm still in shock from that and I'm dreading the holidays now. My reoccurring thought right now is whenever I have kids, they will never know how wonderful their grandma would have been. And any attempt to get a relationship going to start a family seems to hit a roadblock every time. It drives me absolutely insane and I'm constantly wondering what's wrong with me. I'm 28, have a great job, not really needy or overbearing, have a life squared away and moving, in a, moving ahead. I'm honestly wondering if my success is actually the inhibitor. Kind of makes you wonder why in the world I'm doing all this for myself. I have no one to share it with. I generally find myself a positive person and people enjoy their time around me. I'm respectful and try to help people whenever I can, but this last year has been awful. It's hard stopping your brain from going down that. Hmm, why are you doing this to me, God? Mindset. I find myself deep in the thought, thinking that this stuff of some nights after work and I'll just start crying out of the blue. And I get angry. I'm not perfect, never will be, but I'm doing what I can to get ahead in life. My co-workers and I started an oil company with a few oil wells and work at nights and weekends after our day jobs. It's extremely exhausting, but it gets me through the days. It keeps my mind off things and it helps me piece together why all the bad stuff keeps happening. If it helps you, I think Ben, my mom, my grandma are all in a much better place. The world is in a horrible state right now. God needed to pluck them so they can do good work elsewhere. And I keep telling myself I'm very, very thankful they did not have to witness how screwed up things have become. They can finally live in peace on the other side. Amen. I hope that's all true. I hope they are in bliss. Looking down on us. Giving us straight strength to move forward. It's really all I ask for. First story, missing people. Not that old of a case, 2011. The man's name was Mark Bosworth, 54 years old, disappeared September 16, 2011. Exactly, exactly 50 miles west of Crater Lake, Oregon. And he disappeared in a place called Riddle, Oregon at Riddle High School. Here's Crater Lake. Whew. Highway 5 that cuts up and down north and south in Oregon. Got it? Mark was married 25 years to Julie and they had two daughters. And he was what's called a GIS specialist for Portland, the city of Portland Metro. He was a master cartographer and he actually taught cartography at Portland State. He also played guitar in a band. And he also loved to ride road bikes. And he had several. And lastly, he was a self-taught chef who had over 60 cookbooks. And sadly, Mark was a two-time cancer survivor of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He had it, he beat it. In 2010, it came back and it went into remission. And now it was 2011. When this happened, he was volunteering for the Oregon cycle ride. It's a week long ride, 2,300 riders. And they ride through Oregon. And they stay at certain places on their trip they build a tent, mark out a tent. And they're usually at a high school where they can take showers. And then they zonk out at the tent. Well, they stopped at Riddle High School on the 11th. I'm sorry, on the 16th of September. Now, people said that Mark was sometimes staring off in the distance. He'd talk to people and stop and look, almost as though he wasn't paying attention at times, but something didn't seem right. 
Well, before the trip, he started getting some severe headaches. And he called his doctor and he made an appointment that after the bike ride was over, he had an appointment to go see the doctor. He didn't know if the cancer came back again or what. But the volunteers made special note of these blank stares. So at 11.45, on September 16th, Mark was talking to another volunteer. And Mark says, yeah, yeah, I better get back to my tent and get to sleep if I can find it. And the other volunteer said, oh, okay. And Mark walked away. The last time anybody ever saw him. That's sad. Well, the next morning, other volunteers realized he was missing. And they called the sheriff. In, in his tent, the sheriff found his coat, his wallet, his driver's license. The only thing gone were a backpack of his, an iPhone 4, but everything else was in the tent. This happened in Douglas County, Oregon. Picture mark. A very, very, very smart man in good shape. Well, Douglas County called his wife and daughter. They drove down right away. Firefighters, canines, ground pounders, they all converged. And right next to the high school was Cow C.O.W. Creek, bordered the high school. Well, the sheriff brought the canines inside of Mark's tent and let him sniff the pillow Mark slept on. And that first day, they had 120 searchers and two canine teams. And they were looking everywhere, trying to pick up a scent. Here's the official search and rescue missing persons poster from Mark. Well, Julie and the daughter drove down. And a physician had told them that this cancer that he had may have relapsed and actually may affect his thinking, but they weren't sure. There was a $10,000 reward posted. They searched for seven days. And they found nothing, nothing. How, how is that possible? I don't, this is always baffling to me. How can they not find anything? How can the dogs not pick up a scent off the pillowcase? Seems like a natural. So they carried on. And the sheriff said that he didn't find anything to believe that there might be foul play at work, which was troubling because that really gives you no leads. And to think that Mark is walking away in this brain fog where do you go? Well, Julie and the daughter drove all over Southern Oregon, Crater Lake, coast, everywhere, looking for Mark. Put up posters, talk to people. Something I, I want you to pay attention to. Mark had a real high forehead had lost a lot of hair. That's to me is the in, the feature that should stick out. Well, nothing happened on the case for six years, and then in July 2017, a woman calls the sheriff and said, "Hey, I found this backpack a while ago. I put it in my garage, but..." Here it is. I'm not, it's not mine, but somebody lost it. Inside the backpack, Mark's debit card. Hadn't been used since before the bike race where he disappeared. Everyone said, it's a guarantee it's his. The wife identified it. Now, Douglas County never said where the backpack was found bothered me. It's a missing person, not criminal. Why not just say where it was at? Don't understand. 
sometimes I think these agencies don't want to say because you and me would go out and search and maybe we'd find the body and make them look bad. I don't know. But here's the description of Mark I want you to understand. Super smart man. He had a point of separation. After he walks away from the other volunteer, boom, he disappears. He was an athlete and he had severe disability, cancer. Water right next to the school, right next to where they were camping. And canines brought in and don't pick up a cent. So, it's been 12 years since Mark Bosworth disappeared. Where is he? I'm sure if I was Julie and the, and the girls in the back of my mind, I'd be praying every day that my dad, my husband, was walking around somewhere and just didn't know who he was. The reality is, is he's probably deceased somewhere, but where? I don't know. But that was case number one, Mark Bosworth, 54 years old. Next case. How many people out there have read Missing 411, The Sobering, A Sobering Coincidence? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few of you. Well, if you haven't, it's a little different than the other books because it's about young men, predominantly young men, under 30, who disappear after they've been drinking and they're later found in a body of water. And much of the time, the coroner can't determine the cause of death. Now, these cases have been associated with the smiley face killers. Smiley face killers, again, same sort of thing I just explained to you, except they always claim that there were these smiley faces drawn on the side of bridges and things near where these people went missing. Now, in all the work I've done and all the research I've done, I've never seen smiley faces on any of the cases I wrote about, even though they're exactly cookie cutters from what they talked about. The other big difference is, Smiley Face Killers only talked about a very small area of Northeast United States. My cases, 16 countries, Canada, US, all over the US and other countries. So here's the case, Matthew Huzar, and he was a 25 year old, disappeared December 16, 2011 from Vancouver, British Columbia. He was originally from a city called Lethbridge, Alberta. Lethbridge has a, has a tie-in to me and Ben. Tell you the story. When you're a young hockey player, you've got to be seen by scouts in order to be taken to a higher league. So Ben and I went to Alberta and Ben played in a tournament up there and he went he went up a higher level to play in this tournament. He was playing at one level and he jumped up a level. Coach just said, yeah, he's got to jump up. He jumped up, had a great tournament, great. Ben always rose to the occasion, played harder, played better against higher levels. And I sat around for three days. I think I watched four games and he made me so proud. So proud. The end of the fourth game. A general manager from a hockey league in Alberta came to me and he said, Mr. Politis, we really like the way your son plays. We've never seen him before. We want him to come play for us. He's got a future. We know it. So this league, a lot of NHL players came out of it and I knew it. And 
Ben and I had talked and said, you know, really what we want to do is we want to get him picked up by a college so he can get a college education. So when his hockey career is over, he's got something to lean on. And in this league, you forfeit your ability to play in college because you get a stipend that's like $400, $500 a month. and <coughs> But you, this is a primary league that NHL scouts scout out of. And to be asked to play in, for one of these teams was <laughs> unbelievably proud moment for Ben. And we had a we had a great talk leaving there about the pros and cons. And in the end, Ben said, well, yeah, I think, I think I can get a scholarship to play for a Division I team. And if these scouts are right, then I should be able to. And these guys, these general manager, I'll never forget him, he's one of the nicest people I've ever met, called me two or three times. And then when Ben made the decision to play at Miami, Ohio, and at the time, the number one team in the nation took him. This man called me and said, Mr. Politis, you should be very proud. He's in a good place. And he, he worked hard. He deserved it. He could have been really mean and said, well, you know, you didn't want to come play for us. But no, this man wasn't. This man was very nice. We were lucky to meet him. So that's my tie into Lethbridge. I have good memories about that. So Matthew Huzar, he left Lethbridge, graduated from high school, and he got into the University of British Columbia. And he was a biology major, a tough degree. So here's the University of British Columbia right around here. This is Vancouver. Now, I would not go to Vancouver now. It's a dangerous place in a lot of ways, but 15 years ago, it's gorgeous. Very gorgeous. Well, Matthew Huzar disappeared December 16th, 2011. Remember Mark Bosworth? Disappeared September 16th, 2011. Just a few months apart. Matthew was described as a brilliant young man, athletic. He graduated with honors from British Columbia. But when he graduated, he decided that he wanted to sail the world. So what he did is he found a boat, a 49-footer sailboat, and he was restoring it. This is Matthew. He wasn't into drugs, smart, hard worker, just wanted to restore the boat. Well, <clears throat> on December 16th, that night, he was at a place at 92 Water Street in the Gaslight District of Vancouver at a place called the Lamplighter Pub kind of close to the harbor there in Vancouver. He went in with some buddies who had been also working on his boat. They had a few drinks. People said he was not even close to intoxicated. And the group all decided to leave at a specific time. They split up and they all left for home. <clears throat> Matthew left on his own. The next day, Matthew was supposed to meet his mom who was coming in from Vancouver or coming in from Lethbridge to meet her son for Christmas break, her break from work on December 17th. And then Matthew also had his girlfriend coming in for Christmas, and he was supposed to meet her also on the 17th. He didn't meet either one. And his mom said he was the type of young man that would always meet his, he would always do what he said he was gonna do, and he would always keep in touch. He was diligent and he was punctual. And everyone knew something bad had to have happened. So on the 18th, they reported Matthew missing. Well, the police 
in Vancouver did something I I was actually shocked to read about because they seemed kind of scattered, but they really went all in on this search. And the police brought out a bloodhound, ground searchers, airplanes, helicopters. Some people said they saw Matthew in a on a bus leaving the city. Typical things you hear from all kinds of things like this. When a case gets big publicity, this comes out. Well, there was a huge search. Huge. Went on for a week. The police said that they couldn't find any indication. This is before they found the body. No indication of foul play. Oh, okay. Well, two years later, nothing. Nothing on the case. No information. No informants. Nobody can figure out where Matthew went. It was a complete dead end. And then in 2013, in a place called False Harbor, False Creek, somebody sees something floating in the water. This is four kilometers away from Matthew was last seen. They call the police, fire come out, and they recover a body. Weeks later, the coroner identifies the body as Matthew. Says that they can't determine the cause of death. They claimed it was in the water since he disappeared. And I have a couple questions. How can a coroner say a body was in the water for two years? There's no way. First of all, the water in and around Vancouver is cold, really cold. How did the body go two years without being seen? That's number one. Number two, they gave no details about what was on the body, how they identified the body, who identified the body, but they said that there was no evidence of foul play. Hmm. But if you can't determine the cause of death, how do you know that there's no foul play? Hmm. This is an exact match to every other case I've written about regarding young men, 25 year old, brilliant young man, intellectual, who disappears after a night with friends going to a bar. That's, that's it. That is the exact layout. frustrates me so much that this continues to happen and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight. I can't imagine how the mom felt coming out and not being able to see her son. Now let me let me show you the map here. This is the Vancouver Harbor. He was here at 92 Water Street, right where the yellow is. He's found way over here, 4.4 kilometers away, False Creek Harbor. Hmm. Kind of strange, isn't it? How did he get that distance? Nobody knows. What's he doing here? Nobody knows. Why would he be here? Nobody knows. Nobody had any information about this. We're all just supposed to say, oh, okay, that's the end. God rest your soul. Move on. Sorry, folks. That dog don't hunt in my book. Sorry for the who's our family first girlfriend. I'm sorry that there weren't more answers. So those are the two cases. Mark Bosworth, never found. Matthew Huzar, found under very odd circumstances. And the letters. Friends, please share this video with others. Do not buy my books online at Amazon or eBay. You'll pay three, four times as much as they're worth. Not that they're not worth a lot. But you can find my books at our website, 
NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. You can find DVDs for the movie. You can find the books, baseball hats, you name it. Please go by and take a look. And in the meantime, I was out today and there was a older lady <coughs> who was picking up some packages and she had this huge armload and I stopped her and I said, ma'am, if you're going long distance, just let me, let me take some of this for you. You wouldn't mind? No. So I carried it out to her car. She was so appreciative. That's really what life's about. Doing things for loved ones, friends, and even people you don't know. It doesn't hurt. It takes a few seconds out of your life. We need more of that in the world. So, be kind, be nice, and I will see you soon on our website and our video channel. Politus out.